So welcome to all of you. I'm Maria Segarra and I have the honor of chairing this session in which Elma Blaine will be speaking about her research. He has a background in biochemistry and with biomedical medicine at Cardiff University. Her PhD was on cartilage mechanobiology. She is a co-applicant of the Versus Arthritis Biomechanics and Bioengineering Research at Center at the Cardiff University also. She leads a number of research projects with external funding from Versus Arthritis, MRC, EPI, APRC, Dunhill Medical Trust, and the UK Orthopedic Research. She has also invented a patent and currently collaborates with academics and clinicians. The science is a senior lecturer at the Cardiff University, but today she is here to talk about her current work, which is focused on three connected themes, identifying novel mechanotransaction pathways within chondrocytes, understanding how aberrant regulation of these signaling pathways can result in cartilage destruction and identifying new interventions that might delay osteoarthritis within such pathways mentioned. So Emma, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So good morning everybody. Um, yes, so today I'm going to talk about um, some of my research on mechanoregulation of articular cartilage homeostasis. And just to put this into context, I'm a cell biologist, but within the uh, biomechanics and bioengineering research centre, I collaborate extensively with both engineers and clinicians, particularly orthopaedic surgeons, again, very much focusing on taking our basic research and understanding of the tissues and then relating that to uh, downstream clinical application. So for the purpose of this um, talk, I've split the uh, talk into two sections. The first really is to give some background about the seminal studies that have led to our understanding of this subject area. And then the, the latter part of the talk is focused on some of the signaling pathways that my research group have been investigating. So, just to, um, I wasn't sure of everyone's background, so very briefly, just to um, summarise what articular cartilage is. It's found at the ends of our uh, bones, and it's an incredibly important tissue in terms of biomechanical uh, functionality, because what it does is it provides a resilient and compliant articulating surface. It ensures that as the uh, bones move, they articulate, that it enables smooth locomotion. And probably most importantly of all, the presence of this articular cartilage ensures that the loads that are applied across the joints are uniformly dissipated, that you don't see areas, uh, focal areas of hot spots, that there's a uniform dissipation of the load that's applied. Obviously, cartilage doesn't act in isolation. There are a number of other supporting structures within the, the joints, including, if we think about the knee, the meniscus, the cruciate ligaments, which help to um, tether the femur with the tibia. There are the collateral ligaments. There's a whole host of different uh, tissue structures that support the mechanical stability of, of the joint. If we were to cut through a section of this cartilage, you would see something very much like this, where you have the surface of the cartilage tissue, and it's the, the cartilage itself is uh, separated into very distinct zones. At the top, there's the superficial zone, that leads into the, the mid zone, into the deep zone, and then in adult uh, so humans, you find calcified cartilage, which tethers the articular cartilage to the underlying bone. And the other thing really that's important to note about the uh, cartilage is unlike many of the tissues in the body, it has no uh, blood supply, it has no um, nerve supply, it's alymphatic. And that is in some ways beneficial, but equally quite uh, detrimental if you're thinking about ways of being able to repair damaged cartilage. 
But as with um, other tissues, the, the composition of this extracellular matrix very much dictates the, the biomechanical properties of the, of the cartilage itself. As I've already mentioned, there are distinct zones as you move from the surface of the cartilage through to the underlying bone. And within this extracellular matrix are embedded the, the cells. The only cell type present in cartilage are the, the chondrocytes. At the surface, they appear relatively flattened. And then as you extend through the depth of the tissue, they become more spherical and uh, larger and are more metabolically active. Although this uh, figure only depicts a small number of extracellular matrix molecules, needless to say, there are many, many more that exist in the articular cartilage and probably as yet still some to be um, discovered. But key among these extracellular matrix molecules are the collagens. In the surface layer, in the surface zone, this is predominantly a type 1 collagen with a type 3. And then as you extend through the depth of the tissue, it's very much abundant in type 2 collagen. The type 2 collagen can be um, connected to type 9 and type 11 collagen. And then as you move into the calcified zone, this becomes a type 10 collagen. Other key molecules to um, consider is the presence of this uh, superficial zone protein, again, exclusively uh, present in the very uppermost layer. You might see this referred to as uh, lubricin, and this provides the lubricating properties of the articular cartilage, again, enable it to uh, fulfill its mechanical function. The other major component are the proteoglycans, and in cartilage, this is a predominantly made up of agrican. The amounts of these uh, components differ through the depth, and again, it supports its uh, function. Cartilage is uh, considered to be a viscoelastic tissue. When the uh, tissue is subjected to load, the tissue will deform, but this is a reversible process so that once the, the load is removed from the cartilage, it's able to revert back to its original properties in terms of volume, etc. And again, the, the viscoelastic properties are very much governed by the, the biochemical composition of the tissue. The Two major uh, matrix molecules which confer the, the biomechanical functionality are the collagen fibrils. And as I mentioned, they are vary in their um, sort of distribution and the type of collagen. But what um, is unique to this tissue is their arrangement through the depth of the tissue. At the surface, these collagen fibrils lie parallel to the surface. And then as you extend into the depth of the cartilage down into the, the bone, they become perpendicular. And these uh, arcades, these Benninghoff arcades are critically important because they enable the cartilage to uh, withstand a compressive strains that are applied to them during everyday movement. And then if we think about the, um, specifically the viscoelastic properties of the cartilage and the ability of the cartilage to uh, be able to withstand compression, this is also influenced by the presence of the proteoglycans. And as I mentioned, in cartilage, this is predominantly agrican. The, the so biochemistry of agrican, again, influences its ability to um, support the sort of compression resistance that the tissue experiences. The agrican contains a coprotein, off of which are a number of highly sulfated glycosaminoglycans. And you can see in this cartoon that for agrican, they are a predominantly chondroitin sulfate. Because of the net negative charge from the sulfate groups, they attract 
cations into the tissue, so positively charged ions, to maintain an osmotic balance. And in so doing, they can recruit water into the tissue. And this gives cartilage its um, sort of compressibility, the viscoelastic properties, because of, of the ability to imbibe water into the tissue. So as the tissue undergoes compression, there is extensive fluid flow as the um, interstitial fluid is squeezed out of the tissue. But once that load is removed, then you get the re-entry of the, the, the fluid back into the tissue. So you can imagine that in the absence of either of these two matrix molecules, that will compromise the, the functionality, the biomechanical functionality of the tissue. There are a number of different types of mechanical load that are experienced by the cartilage uh, in vivo. Ordinarily, this will be uh, physiological in its uh, parameters. This sort of reflects um, sort of everyday um, movement, etc. And it's dynamic in nature. If you think about your gait, then um, you're obviously um, applying load and then taking load off as, as you sort of step. But there are instances where the load supplied may be um, hyperphysiological, i.e. non-physiological. Again, this might be attributed to excessive loading on our joints, or equally, it could be due to an acute or injurious load being applied. And these will have different consequences to the homeostasis of the cartilage compared to um, under physiological regimes. The other thing to bear in mind is that there is also um, the unloaded situation. This doesn't uh, ordinarily happen, but there are um, certain instances where the tissue can be unloaded. And again, the downstream effects on the chondrocytes will um, very much dictate that load being applied. Much of our understanding of the types of uh, pressures that are applied to our joints comes from a very um, early study by Hodge et al. Uh, back in 1986, where they recruited patients that were undergoing hip replacements and they um, had uh, prosthetics that had strain gauges um, in incorporated within them so that when the prosthetics were implanted back into the patients, they were then able to record in real time in vivo measurements. And you can see that uh, even at rest, there is a small amount of pressure being exerted on <clears throat> the, the, the tissues in, in the hip joint. This is um, attributed mainly to sort of muscle activity, a range during walking, um, and this relates to the, the the, the sort of the gait, the, the sort of cycle of, of um, applying the heel strike and then um, taking off the, the weight. Climbing stairs and then higher impact activities where uh, in excess of uh, 20 megapascal peak pressure um, has been experienced. And this really puts it into perspective with where uh, fractures can occur. And it's been recorded that um, sort of mean uh, pressure when fracture has resulted is around 35. So there is a very fine balance between what is considered a physiological load and then what um, is non-physiological. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. But what is uh, clearly evident is that the, the cartilage, as with many of the other tissues in the body, is capable of adapting to the mechanical loads that it experiences in vivo. And this study by uh, Brahma et al. looked at the uh, metacarpal joint, the cartilage in the metacarpal joint in the wrist and the uh, phalanx, the, the finger joint. And what they did is they looked at the biochemical composition of the cartilage. They looked at water content because um, the, the cartilage is highly hydrated and that confers its uh, viscoelastic properties. 
they looked at the glycosaminoglycan content, collagen content, and a cross-linking of these uh, collagen molecules. And what they could see, because if you can appreciate that within the joints, it's not a flat joint, there will be um, sort of different uh, geometrical, anatomical um, regions within the, the joint surface. And what they did is they tried to map the biochemical properties with the, the biomechanical behavior. And you can clearly see, depending on which joint we're, we're referring to, that there are differences in the composition of these um, important uh, sort of uh, biochemical molecules uh, and water. And this very much dictates how the tissue can adapt and withstand the mechanical loads that are uh, being put upon it. Much of our understanding of how the cartilage uh, responds to mechanical load uh, goes back to um, quite early studies. And what we do know is that if the physiological range of loads is applied, then that induces extracellular matrix synthesis. And this is beneficial in terms of the health of the cartilage. This study uh, was conducted on um, beetle dogs. They were acclimatized, so they were trained to run on a treadmill at a 15 degree um, incline, so an uphill. And this cohort of dogs were exercised for four kilometers a day over five days a week for 15 weeks. And what they found at the end of the study is the, a, almost a 25% increase in the thickness of the cartilage. So by exercising these dogs for four kilometers a day, they improved the thickness of the cartilage and the, the thickness of that cartilage was uh, primarily due to an increase in the synthesis of glycosaminoglycans. So they are the key components of the, the proteoglycans of the agrican. And this was an important finding because it really demonstrated a link between mechanical load and the biochemical properties of the tissue. So by applying a physiological load, we're able to increase the, the, the health of the, the articular cartilage. The um, sort of continuation of, of these studies really was then to to sort of determine, well, if physiological loads are beneficial, if non-physiological loads are applied, what, what happens to the, the, the cartilage? Again, using the, the same model system where they had uh, beetle dogs running on a treadmill, they then increased the, the sort of extent of the exercise to run in 20 kilometers a day, again, five days a week for 15 weeks. And this time, what they saw was, although it was more subtle, they saw a reduction in the thickness of the cartilage, particularly in the medial compartment. And this is quite interesting because in um, human pathology, the, the beginning of the, the loss of cartilage, the degradation of the cartilage, is normally observed in the medial compartment of the knee. They found that the most pronounced reduction in the um, glycosaminoglycans was at the surface, so in the superficial zone of the cartilage. Then the, another cohort of uh, dogs, again part of the same study, were exercised excessively, so 40 kilometers a day, again 15, uh, five days a week for 15 weeks. And they saw a further uh, reduction in the thickness of the cartilage and a reduction, a significant reduction in the glycosaminoglycan content. And you can see that depicted in these uh, histological images. So in the, the animals that had undergone the 40 kilometers a day, you can see that there is a significant loss of uh, staining for the proteoglycans, for the glycosaminoglycans. This is the surface of the tissue and you can see that compared to the control, there was a, a, a sort of substantial reduction. 
So what these uh, early studies indicated is that mechanical load is essential for maintaining the integrity of the cartilage and that there was a, 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 a sort of um, an effect of increasing the, um, the load, the exercise, and that ultimately it was the, the first um, study, the, the four kilometers a day um, exercise regime, which was most beneficial to the health of the cartilage. So clearly there is a window at which the amount of load applied is uh, physiological and it's beneficial to the maintenance of the articular cartilage and that excessive loading was found to be quite detrimental in vivo. So these, these really give um, the first indication of how important mechanical load is on maintaining articular cartilage homeostasis. And this is where the, the sort of concept of this balance between um, anabolism and catabolism really comes into play. Because when physiological loads are applied, there is clearly an increase in matrix production and particularly referring to uh, type two collagen and agrican, because as I mentioned, they uh, confer the viscoelastic properties of, of the, the cartilage tissue. However, this balance can tip in favor of matrix catabolism. And this is normally evident when uh, non-physiological loads are applied. And here, not only do you see a reduction in the production of these key extracellular matrix molecules, you also see an increase in the enzymes that actually break down the pre-existing extracellular matrix. When this occurs, it leads to the pathology of osteoarthritis. And just to sort of very quickly um, summarize, I'm sure you're all um, familiar with osteoarthritis, it's a very common musculoskeletal condition but it's characterized by loss of articular cartilage. You see joint space narrowing on um, x-rays, the development of osteophytes, there's um, inflammation, pain, and ultimately loss of mobility. And in this disease, we know that there's a homeostatic imbalance uh, in, in the cartilage and it favors catabolism. So cartilage breakdown as opposed to cartilage synthesis. It's multifactorial in its origin, and there are a number of risk factors, but the one that is of um, interest for my research group is the influence of this abnormal or non-physiological loading and how that can influence the sort of biochemical properties of the, the cartilage tissue. There are many ways in which um, mechanical load can act as a risk factor. Historically, occupation, um, jobs such as mining, farming, etc., increase the risk of uh, developing OA. Also, um, recurrent sports injuries or a previous joint trauma. This could be due to um, sports, for example, or um, vehicle accidents, etc. Maybe more sort of prevalent in uh, today's society is the impact of obesity. I should point out that with obesity, there is a mechanical element because of the additional load being placed through the joints. But we now know that the uh, white adipose tissue also releases uh, specific molecules, adipokines, which are pro-inflammatory in nature, and they can contribute to the breakdown of the tissue. And speaking to uh, clinicians uh, sort of locally, they are seeing people coming into uh, surgery for joint replacements at a much younger age, and that appears to, to correlate with a much higher uh, BMI body mass index. So there is a clear link between uh, obesity and uh, cartilage breakdown and the need for joint replacements. Again, our understanding of how the load or abnormal load influences cartilage metabolism goes back to, to studies in the early 1970s 
And this is a seminal study that really evidenced the link between joint instability and the development of um, osteoarthritis. And this is uh, referred to as the pond Nuki model. And what the um, authors did is they severed the cruciate ligament. If you think back to the, one of my uh, first slides where I said how important the cruciates are in stabilizing the joint, if you uh, sever the ligament, then you create joint instability. And in these animals, uh, beetle dogs, the animals were able to weight bear, but they were weight bearing on a very unstable joint. And over a very short period of 12 weeks, it was clear to see that this joint instability so influencing the mechanical properties of the, the joint impacted on the health of the cartilage. There was evidence of a surface roughening, starting to see loss of the, the integrity of the cartilage, as well as the development of osteophytes, so bony outgrowths from the, the cartilaginous surface. In the um, same model, which they took out a little bit further, they extended this to 26 weeks and they looked at the histology. They saw that over this um, six month window, there was a significant reduction in the components of the cartilage tissue. There was um, a loss of the integrity of the surface of the tissue. You could see um, fissures and cracks developing and that by the end of the, the six month period, very little cartilage remained. And this is what we observe in um, patients with osteoarthritis, particularly end stage osteoarthritis when they present at the, the clinic for um, joint replacements. And again, this joint instability, altering the mechanical properties within the, the, the cartilage inhibited the production of these key matrix molecules, the proteoglycans and the collagens, and they saw increased expression of the enzymes that break, down, break them down. So the matrix metalloproteinases, which break down the collagen, and the ADMTSs, the agrokinases, which break down the proteoglycans. This model was um, obviously a surgical model because there was a surgical intervention to induce joint instability. So what we've been doing in Cardiff is developing a non-surgical model, a non-invasive model that better recapitulates what um, one might observe um, in humans. You know, if they've had um, a sort of skiing accident, maybe um, following a sort of football injury, etc. And what we've done is um, sort of adapted the, the model that was developed by uh, Blondine Poulet and Andy Pitsilides in the Royal Vet College in London and applied not only a single episode of compression, but compression with an element of shear. What we uh, do is we place um, an anaesthetized um, mouse, the, the knee joint into these custom built cups, and then we apply a single load with a 30 degree offset. So as the compression is being applied to the joint, there's an element of shear. And this very much, as I said, represents quite often an injury you might see um, you know, in football, um, skiing accident, etc. So one load with an element of, of shear. When we apply this um, sort of injurious load, what we see quite rapidly are significant changes in the knee joints of these mice. So once they have had this um, single episode of load, what happens is that the, the cruciate ligaments are ruptured, very much like the Ponyuki, except that this is non-invasive and it's mechanically induced. Within um, a few minutes, really, of the load being applied, the, the mice are able to um, weight bear and we follow them over a period of um, 21 days. And we can see histologically that uh, even as early as three days post rupture of these cruciate ligaments, there is um, synovial infiltration. So there's an acute inflammatory response. 
And we do see um, signs of cartilage loss on the medial femoral condyle. And that's in comparison to the uninjured uh, limbs. If we take this out to 14 days, where the yellow arrows are, you can clearly see that there is a significant loss of the articular cartilage from the uh, femoral condyles. And by uh, day 21, we see extensive remodeling uh, within the, uh, the ligamentous site, the, the sort of torn ligament. We see the development of uh, osteophytes and there is extensive damage to the joint. There's bone remodeling, et cetera. And this very much recapitulates uh, some of the features you see in end-stage um, human osteoarthritis. We can uh, sort of quantify the extent of damage to the cartilage using the international OC scoring system. And again, you can see that even as early as uh, day three, we're starting to see degeneration, loss of the cartilage, particularly in the medial compartment. And then this is exacerbated at day 14 and day 21. So that by day 21, there is no cartilage uh, or very little cartilage remaining on the, the condyles in particular, as well as on the, the tibial plateaus. So the question really then is how is this mechanical load influencing the, the loss of these matrix molecules within the cartilage and causing this degeneration? And uh, we've published this model a couple of years ago now, but we looked specifically at uh, pro-inflammatory mechanisms because the, there is extensive swelling in the, the joints, in the, in the knees, once the, the cruciates have been ruptured and there's instability in the joint. And what we uh, found is that I, for today, I'm just presenting the um, pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-6, but we also saw it with um, other cytokines, including interleukin-17, is a significant upregulation in these pro-inflammatory molecules. Their expression is significantly increased following this uh, traumatic injury and then the uh, altered weight bearing properties of the joint. In addition to this, we looked at, um, so th these components include the um, cruciate ligament, the synovial infiltrate, the meniscus. So we looked at all of the joint components. But if we then looked and specifically at what was happening in the articular cartilage, again, uh, we saw uh, induction of interleukin-6, so that this pro-inflammatory molecule, we saw induction of the enzyme that is responsible for the production of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, again, is a pro-inflammatory molecule implicated in, in many diseases. And we also saw increased expression of uh, two of the enzymes that are responsible for the breakdown of the, the molecules within the cartilage. This includes ADAMTS4, which breaks down the agrican, and MMP3, which contributes to the breakdown of collagen. So we could clearly see <clears throat> that in, the, um, in, in these joints where there is altered weight bearing because of this joint instability, we see induction of a whole host of inflammatory molecules, and that these can increase the expression of enzymes which contribute to the breakdown of the, the cartilage tissue itself. I do want to say, and just sort of um, put this into context, is that there are the, these effects on joint homeostasis are observed when you apply uh, non-physiological loads, i.e. excessive or um, acute traumatic loads, but the tissue is also sensitive to the environment where no load is applied. And again, uh, very seminal studies back in the late 1970s demonstrated this very elegantly, that there had to be a certain amount of uh, mechanical load and weight bearing on the cartilage in order to maintain joint homeostasis. If this uh, load wasn't applied, then again, it induced uh, catabolism 
of the cartilage. In order to demonstrate this, they immobilized uh, the, 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 the hind limbs of uh, dogs and they used a plaster cast to immobilize the, the joint for eight weeks. And what they found is that following that eight week period where the um, animals were unable to bear weight on these um, limbs, they found a significant reduction in the thickness of the articular cartilage, almost a 50% reduction. And this was attributed to a loss of uh, proteoglycans and collagen within the extracellular matrix. But what was really interesting, and it really does evidence how how clever you know, the tissues are in our body is that in a, a separate cohort of uh, animals that underwent this joint immobilization, once the, the, the cast was removed, they found that the effects were reversible. So in these uh, dogs, following the ability to then uh, weight bear again, the effects were reversed and they were able to uh, retain or re replenish the, the articular cartilage that had been lost. Again, evidencing how good our tissues are at uh, functionally adapting to the mechanical load. So this is sort of the, the sort of history of, of our understanding of how important mechanical load is on the, the, the health of our tissues, but how do the chondrocytes actually sense this mechanical load? And research has been ongoing in this area for a couple of decades now to try and address how the load that is uh, placed on the cartilage is perceived by the cells within it. And as I mentioned, these are the, the, the chondrocytes. When load is applied, there will be a number of changes within the extracellular matrix. This might include um, fluid flow, as I mentioned, it's a highly hydrated tissue. It may affect the um, osmolarity of, of the, the tissue. It may enable growth factors to be released, etc. And all of these changes are then sensed by the, the chondrocytes themselves. And again, there are a number of different mechanisms by which the chondrocytes can sense mechanical perturbations or, or experience the, the, the loads that have been applied to the tissue. One of the, the first to be identified was the uh, alpha-5 beta-1 integrin. It's a key chondrocyte mechanoreceptor, and it's able to link the extracellular matrix molecules in, outside the cell internally to the cytoskeleton. The cilia are able to uh, sense mechanical perturbations and they are important in um, detecting these changes and uh, influence the, the release of calcium. Calcium is particularly important. There are a number of stretch activated channels which will um, open and close in response to load and will allow the uh, influx uh, and efflux of calcium. And more recently, a number of other calcium channels have been uh, identified, the TRIP-V and PISO channels. And what's particularly interesting about the PISO channels, uh, two have been characterized to date, and PISO2 is only activated, the channel is only activated in response to uh, non-physiological or injurious loads. So clearly there, there is very much a, a sort of differential response depending on the mechanical load that is applied. But uh, for the purpose of the, the remainder of this talk, I just want to focus on three specific pathways that we've been investigating. The uh, first is the, the cytoskeleton. Then mention some of the work we've been doing on the WINTS. And finally, um, looking at uh, microRNAs and epigenetic regulation, because all of these different uh, molecular pathways will contribute to how uh, the um, components within cartilage are able to be regulated by mechanical load in order to uh, with, withstand the, 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 the weight bearing. 
The cytoskeleton is present uh, in uh, all cells. There are three specific um, cytoskeletal networks. The first are the uh, actin microfilaments. We then have the microtubules. And the third group are the intermediate filaments, which in chondrocytes are uh, the fermentin um, cytoskeletal um, intermediate filaments. And they have a myriad of functions within the, the cells, but of particular interest uh, to me are the mechanical functions. If you look at their organization within the chondrocyte, they extend from the plasma membrane right through to the, the nucleus. So they are present throughout the cytoplasm. And very much um, akin to the, the sort of skeleton in our bodies, the, the collagen networks in the tissues, the cytoskeletal uh, proteins are important in providing mechanical strength to the cells so that when they are exposed to mechanical loads, they're able to uh, withstand those loads rather than uh, apoptose and die. And in particular, the uh, actin microfilaments have been shown to be able to deform um, by uh, quite considerably in response to load. So these are clearly uh, very capable at withstanding the loads that are applied. Less is known about the intermediate filaments. There is a knockout model where they've knocked out the um, fermentin intermediate filaments and they found that the cells were uh, unable to withstand uh, mechanical forces that were applied to them. So clearly it did indicate that there was some relevance of these intermediate filaments to mechanotransduction and to the, the, the ability of the cells to uh, withstand these loads. We looked into this and um, using an in vitro loading model where we took uh, bovine cartilage explants, we applied an injurious load to see what effect it would have on the uh, organization of the fermenting cytoskeleton. And using um, uh, immunofluorescence microscopy, confocal um, microscopy, we found that in the presence of this um, injurious load, we saw the pooling of this uh, fermenting cytoskeleton. So rather than remaining so sort of extended throughout the cell in this very highly organized um, sort of network, we found that when an injurious load was applied, the fermenting cytoskeleton collapsed and it cooled within the cytoplasm. And we could uh, mimic that in vitro. We could add um, acrylamide, an agent which uh, disrupts the fermenting cytoskeleton. So ordinarily you'd see this a dense meshwork throughout the cytoplasm. When you add acrylamide, it becomes um, disrupted, the fermenting network collapses. And in these cells, what we found is that if the fermenting cytoskeleton was compromised, i.e. it was disrupted, disassembled, then it interfered with the production of um, collagen. Very minimal effects. Um, or little no, to no effect on the um, glycosaminoglycans, but there was a significant reduction in collagen. And other groups have since shown uh, very similar effects in other cell types, including uh, mesenchymal stromal cells, that if the fermentin network is compromised, it interferes with the abilities of the cells to produce collagen. So this sort of indicates that a, an intact fermentin cytoskeleton is important not only for providing mechanical strength, but also important for uh, contributing to the signaling mechanisms that lead to the production of uh, collagen. We also utilized uh, this model system, this uh, bovine cartilage uh, explant system, to, to look more globally at changes in gene expression. For this, we used um, RNA-seq, and we, rather than applying an injurious load, we applied um, a load that was considered to be 
um, non-physiological, but not to the point where it would induce uh, cell death. We applied the load just short term. We wanted to see what the early uh, changes in transcription were, and then analyzed four hours after the application of load. And not surprisingly, a huge number of genes were shown to be regulated by mechanical load. And many fell into a number of, of different key pathways. But what uh, we were particularly interested in is the fact that 4% uh, of the genes that did change were related to Wnt signaling. So uh, Wnt's are a family of molecules. They are critically important in the development and maturation of articular cartilage. It's also known from a number of knockout studies that the Wnt's are uh, critical in maintaining the cartilage uh, phenotype. And that if you alter Wnt signaling, it can um, significantly impact on uh, the health of the tissue and it leads to cartilage degradation. So we wanted to look a little bit more at what, was, what uh, Wnt components were being regulated by mechanical load in our model system. And what we found, which we weren't really sort of expecting, is that in addition to uh, beta-catenin, which is part of the canonical Wnt signaling pathway, we also found a number of uh, genes that were upregulated that fell into the non-canonical Wnt signaling pathway. So most of the, the studies in this area have very much focused on the canonical Wnt signaling pathway. And so it was sort of surprising that we seem to have a group of the non-canonical Wnt signaling genes that were regulated by our non-physiological load. And these were all significantly upregulated in response to our non-physiological load. Very few were downregulated, but one of those that uh, was significantly downregulated is an inhibitor for the Wnt signaling pathway. So the fact that this inhibitor is downregulated indicates that it, the, the, the load being applied is promoting more of this uh, Wnt signaling pathway. As I mentioned, the, the components that we found that were regulated by mechanical load were part of the non-canonical Wnt signaling pathway. So there are two non-canonical Wnt signaling pathways. The uh, first one is the planar cell polarity pathway, which ultimately leads to reorganization of the cytoskeleton. And then the second pathway is the, the calcium pathway. And what happens is that when Wnt's bind to their uh, receptor, there is um, a sort of series of intracellular signaling events, which ultimately lead to the release of calcium. These then influence these uh, downstream enzymes, which can lead to the translocation of this group of transcriptional activators. It leads to the translocation from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And NFATs were uh, a number of the, the genes that we found to be significantly regulated by our non-physiological load. They have a number of targets and that very much depends on the, the tissue itself, but of interest to us in uh, our cartilage research is that two of the downstream targets are ADAMTS5, so the enzyme involved in uh, agrican breakdown, and MMP9, which is important in collagen breakdown. What we did initially was just verify that the expression of these uh, Wnt components uh, was indeed uh, regulated by the non-physiological load. And we found that um, NFATC1 is uh, significantly increased in, our, uh, in response to non-physiological load. There are four other uh, NFATs, part of this family of transcriptional activators. And we also saw a very similar effect when we looked at the expression of NFATC2. So NFATC1 and NFATC2 are significantly upregulated in response to a non-physiological load. And we also confirmed that the um, DICOF1 
one of the inhibitors of this uh, pathway was uh, significantly reduced in response to the, the non-physiological load. To try and sort of dissect a little bit further the importance of this pathway in um, cartilage homeostasis, we applied a specific NFAT inhibitor. So this inhibitor um, specifically targets all five of the NFATs. It doesn't discriminate NFAT C1 from any of the others. It's, it's um, all of them. And we found that if we added the inhibitor to inhibit the uh, NFAT uh, signaling pathway, then we saw a significant reduction in load-induced MMP9 and ADAM-TS5 expression. So these would ordinarily increase in response to the non-physiological load. But if you inhibit this um, non-canonical wind signaling pathway, then we inhibited their expression. From this, we um, sort of alluded to the fact that in response to excessive or injurious um, load, we see activation of this non-canonical wind signaling pathway. It enables the translocation of these NFATs uh, into the nucleus. And as I say, they act as transcriptional activators and they activate the expression of some of these downstream targets, including MMP9 and ADAM-TS5, which then have the potential to go on and degrade the extracellular matrix components. So we are continuing to, to look at how uh, important this uh, NFAT pathway is in maintaining cartilage homeostasis. Whilst we were uh, looking at the transcriptional profile of mechanically regulated genes, we also looked at the microRNA profile. So the microRNAs are a step uh, further back, so they are important in regulating the, the transcription of a number of these target genes. And at the time we started this study, a little bit was known about the Mukana regulation of microRNAs in um, tendon, for example, and in um, the vasculature, but nothing had really been done in articular cartilage. So we again performed a, a microRNA seq approach to just look to see which uh, microRNAs were um, Meccana sensitive. Initially in our bovine uh, explant model, and we found a number of microRNAs that were either regulated by both loads because we applied either a load that was more representative of physiological load or a load uh, representative of the, the non-physiological load. We've, I, we found a cohort of microRNAs that were regulated by load full stop. And then we found a separate cohort of uh, microRNAs that appear to be only regulated by this uh, non-physiological load. And you know, this was quite interesting, again, demonstrating that there are different mechanisms at play depending on whether the loads being applied are physiological or non-physiological. We verified the um, expression of a number of these microRNAs. We identified microRNA 21, 27, 221, and 222. And many of the downstream targets of these molecules include the um, type 2 collagen, uh, SOX9, which is a um, transcriptional regulator of a chondrogenesis, um, some of the uh, WINTS, uh, TGF beta signaling pathways. So, again, the, the, the sort of downstream are very much. Um, related to the signaling pathways which we know are important in maintaining cartilage homeostasis. Because this was all um, sort of carried out in our in vitro explant system, we verified in our uh, in vivo uh, loading model that the expression of these microRNAs were regulated by mechanical load. And yes, you can see um, that these genes, uh, these microRNAs are um, significantly regulated. Since then, we've gone one step further and we've looked more uh, globally at the expression of uh, microRNAs in our uh, in vivo loading model. 
and just looked globally to see which microRNAs are a change in expression in response to this a joint instability and the altered weight bearing. And there are a number of uh, targets um, beyond the ones that I've presented here. And they are particularly interesting because they also are microRNAs that regulate matrix molecules. They regulate pro-inflammatory um, cytokines, as well as um, classical pathways, such as, I say, the WINTS and uh, TGF beta signaling. So very much, uh, much more to be investigated in how mechanical load influences microRNAs to affect downstream function. And ultimately, going back to, to um, the sort of the scope of, of this summer school really is that our goal is to ultimately prevent this step from occurring. When um, uh, people have um, joint instability, mechanical injury, what we don't want to see is this uh, degeneration of the joint, um, you know, particularly the cartilage leading to osteoarthritis. And by utilizing our uh, in vitro and in vivo models and trying to characterize the uh, molecular signaling pathways which promote this degeneration is to develop, to identify those molecules and develop uh, therapeutics that we can use to target um, early on as an intervention so that we can, we can stop the progression of this joint degeneration and again, sort of, um, a stratified approach to being able to develop the, 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 the sort of drugs that will alleviate uh, osteoarthritis. And we are currently using our in vivo model to test a number of potential uh, therapeutics identified from um, some of our sort of, um, sort of basic research to see if they have potential as a, a sort of an intervention going forward. And really sort of bringing it all together is just to, to sort of demonstrate how dynamic this process is. So when a tissue is exposed to mechanical load, and it can be any tissue uh, in the body, not necessarily uh, cartilage, the tissue will respond to that uh, mechanical input. It can change, as we've seen in, in the, my presentation, change um, transcriptional output. It can influence the um, production and secretion of a number of uh, proteins and other matrix molecules. All of this is highly important because it feeds back to the, the tissue in terms of how it's then able to respond to continued mechanical load. And this is why it's such a dynamic process in that the, the tissues can sense this mechanical load, respond to it, and then feed back to um, functionally adapt to the loads being applied. Finally, I'd just like to um, thank, uh, these are some of the people that contributed to the work I've presented and with the microRNAs um, collaborators at Newcastle University and um, some of the funding bodies who supported the, the funding that um, I've presented. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Irma, for your nice presentation. So the ones that have some questions, please raise your hand or just write it to the chat. Roger, you, you no. So if anyone has any questions, I will ask. Okay, um, you talk about the one um, signaling pathways and I'm interested in the way or how do you deal with cross-linking within signaling pathways or in the way that you know, for example, that it's this signal pathway is only active when there's an, uh, when there is some injurious load acting on the joint, and it's not active when there's no joint loading. So, the as with many of the, the pathways, they will be um, undoubtedly switched on in response to physiological load because 
the, the, the sort of homeostasis of the tissue is reliant on those signaling mechanisms. But I think what, what normally happens is that the pathways are switched on, but then they are switched off again after that stimulus has been um, perceived by the cells. But the, some of the um, evidence coming out is that when you apply a non-physiological or an injurious load, you get sustained uh, wind signaling. So it's not able to control its switching on and switching off, and you get um, sustained wind signaling. And it's at that point then that you might start to um, influence some of the, the more negative um, consequences of sustained signaling. But no, undoubtedly, under physiological load, they, these pathways will be switched on and then they, they will be switched off. And, you know, as you've said, there's, there's an incredible amount of interplay between a number of these signaling pathways. And, you know, we've seen looking at some of the um, outputs from our RNA-seq that there, there is a lot of, um, sort of crosstalk between signaling pathways um, redundancy with some of the molecules that we've identified, and then they link back to the microRNAs that we have identified because we can then see how they can influence the um, activation of a number of these signal and pathways. And it, you know, it's it's highly complex. We've been looking at you know uh, a, a pathway almost in isolation, but really once you look at the the global picture you realize just how interrelated a number of these signaling pathways are. And therefore, you know, they're all you know, very important in maintaining that joint homeostasis. Yeah, it's a world when you look at all the cross-linking and signaling pathways. So if, if there's anyone that has a question. No, I do. <laughs> So, Hi Emma, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I had some more questions. Have you looked at, um, for example, epigenetics like um, methylation, chromatin, and remodeling um, uh, uh, processed after the, the load? No, we haven't um, looked at any of that yet. We've only sort of recently started looking at uh, epigenetic regulation and we've sort of looked so we've got a large sort of um, data set looking at microRNAs. And I think really the, the sort of next stage is to, to look at some of the other modes of epigenetic regulation. Um, cartilage, unlike a number of other tissues and fields, seems to sort of be maybe less advanced in our understanding of many of these mechanisms. And um, so there's, you know, there's much to still be explored. But we're, we're sort of still in the kind of infancy of, of uh, where our research is at with the um, uh, epigenetics. Okay, so I think that there's any questions. I had one, Maria. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I am. Uh, thank you very much for, for the very nice presentation. Um, yes. So let, let, let's be quick because otherwise, because we need to go to it. But um, yeah, um, I have one question related then the difference between uh, so secondary uh, secondary cartilage degeneration uh, because of initial mechanical. Uh, uh, insult and idiopathic. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look, for example, at the at the experiments uh, from the colleagues in in Einoven, uh, René van Donkelaar, I guess you, you you know them, and so they have uh, tried to see what was first developed, uh, uh, if protoglycans or collagen, and then they were using mechanical setups with biochemical um, biochemical analysis and. They found that uh, actually protoglycans uh, were likely to be the first micromolecule uh, to uh, to be depleted and then uh, to, to to induce a cascade of degeneration. 
However, if you look at uh, more biochemical analysis uh, of idiopathic osteoarthritis patients, uh, it seems that MMP13 is, is actually the, the largest hallmark of uh, osteoarthritis, meaning that collagen type two uh, would come first. So what is, what is your view here? Do you think that there might be uh, actually different biochemical uh, histories in the long-term degeneration in idiopathic osteoarthritis compared to secondary osteoarthritis that uh, would emerge from mechanical injury? Yes, so I, I think, um, so our model sort of represents the um, sort of secondary osteoarthritis or post-traumatic OA. And I think then that there's a very, you know, key differences between that and um, primary OA. I mean, sort of historically, it's always been thought that the proteoglycans are depleted first, and then the um, MMPs come in to target the, the, the collagen. And that's what um, a number of our, you know, in vitro assays would say. But I think there needs to be some cleavage of the collagen in order to release the proteoglycans to then to then be lost. The, the sort of question around um, the sort of makeup of uh, primary versus secondary uh, OA and the importance of the sort of mechanical component is, is a really interesting one. And although it's not in the, in the presentation, um, collaborating with um, orthopedic surgeons to try and investigate the, the, the importance of the mechanics in um, the, the differences between the primary and secondary OA. And we are looking at um, comparing the knee and the ankle. So primary OA, um, particularly um, prevalent in joints such as the um, knee and the hip, but you see very little incidence of primary OA in the ankle. Most of the um, incidence of um, ankle OA is due to mechanical trauma. And sort of trying to delineate why those differences arise. Why, why is the ankle less susceptible to the, the normal um, risk factors of sort of um, primary idiopathic OA? And, you know, is it to do with the biochemistry? Is it to do with the, the biomechanics? And so we're, we're sort of looking at that as a sort of side project um, because clearly the, the sort of mechanics might influence a, a different um, sort of molecular mechanism of destruction than you might necessarily see with the uh, primary the idiopathic OA. But in terms of the proteoglycan collagen, yeah, sort of historically you would say the proteoglycans are lost first, but um, you know, more of the evidence emerging suggests then that, you know, there will be that collagen cleavage to then release the, the proteoglycans. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. So, um, yes, actually, I would have plenty of questions, but it's, uh, it's already uh, 13, 18, and everyone needs time to, to eat. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, Maria, I leave you close the session. Okay, thank you. Um, well, so, see you on in an hour for the posters. Session. Yeah, so we come back exactly at 14.10 and mm -hmm. we will have the presentation of the best VPHI thesis awards uh, in, in silico medicine. Yeah. Okay. See you then. Bye. Okay. So enjoy the lunch, everyone. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.